be in the Lord's house with you tonight. A special welcome if you're visiting. Take a few seconds and greet each other in the name of our Savior Jesus. Introduce yourself if there's somebody you don't know. This Sunday is the Festival of the Reformation of the Church. It actually falls on the day. This year, October 31st, we remember how Martin Luther on that day in 1517 uh, put up his 95 theses or statements uh, on points of false teaching in the church of his time, and that triggered uh, a reform, the truth of God's word that we are saved from our sins simply by God's grace for us. It comes to us through faith, and that comes through the scriptures uh, that was brought out into the open again. And we thank the Lord for that reform, and we also pray that it might continue and his word might be free and unbound. Our opening hymn is Luther's Hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, number 200.
service is printed out for us in the service folder. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God, our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word, protect and comfort them in all temptations, defend them against all their enemies, and bestow on the church your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for our observance of the Festival of the Reformation is the Old Testament lesson from the prophet Daniel in chapter 3, verses 16 through 28. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar, We have no need to answer you about this matter. Since our God, whom we serve, does exist, he is able to save us from the blazing, fiery furnace. So he may save us from your hand, your majesty. But if he does not, you should know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage and the expression on his face changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said to heat the furnace seven times hotter than it was usually heated. He ordered some men, who were soldiers from his army, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to throw them into the blazing, fiery furnace. So these men were bound in their coats, their pants, their turbans, and their other clothing, and they were thrown into the middle of the blazing, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace was extremely hot, those men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were killed by the intense heat of the fire. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had been tied up, fell into the blazing, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was startled and immediately stood up. He said to his advisors, Didn't we throw three men who had been tied up into the middle of the fire? They answered the king, Certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men who are untied and walking around in the middle of the fire unharmed. And what is more, the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar approached the door of the blazing, fiery furnace. He said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the middle of the furnace. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the royal advisors gathered together and looked at these men. 
The fire had no power over their bodies. Not a hair on their head was singed. Their robes were not damaged. And the smell of fire had not stuck to them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and saved his servants, who trusted in God and ignored the king's command. They gave up their bodies and did not pay homage or worship to any god except their god. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We respond to the word by singing the psalm of the day, Psalm 46, page 84 in the front of the hymnal. The second reading, which is the basis for the sermon, is from the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. St. John wrote, Then I saw another angel flying in the middle of the sky. He had the everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the sky, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel. Alleluia. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Gospel for the day is from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 13, verses 5 through 11. Jesus began by telling them, Be careful that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. Whenever you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled. Such things must happen, but the end is not yet. In fact, 
nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. But be on your guard. People will hand you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand in the presence of rulers and kings for my sake as a witness to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Whenever they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand what you should say. Say whatever is given to you in that hour, because you will not be the one speaking. Instead, it will be the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day, number 203, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and from our Savior, Jesus Christ. So two weeks in a row, readings from the book of Revelation. We don't have too many lessons in our worship from the book of Revelation. Many people regard the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, as a very scary book. And yes, there are pictures, visions that Jesus gave to John. The full title would be The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And he gave these visions to his apostle John to write down. And he used pictures. Dragons, yes. Um, destruction, yes. Four horsemen, yes. And they can be frightening. But ask yourself this question. In his word, does your heavenly father really want to scare you? No. The revelation of Jesus that he gave to the apostle John is really a victory story. It tells us the reality of what's going on now in this world, what's going on now in heaven, and what will be going on in heaven forever. And what's going on in heaven is that eternal victory of Jesus and his people. In the Revelation, there are almost so many, also so many pictures that John sees of, of the saints, the people, dressed in white robes, which were made white in the blood of the Lamb, praising God and full of joy. And they're holding palm branches in their hands, a symbol of victory in the time of the Roman Empire. So it's a victory book. It tells you that if you're connected to Jesus, you remain faithful to him, and that 
very familiar confirmation verse that many people have from chapter 2 of Revelation. Be faithful to the point of death, I will give you the crown of life. That's what it's about. As people were struggling, as there were challenges to their faith, to their relationship with Jesus, Jesus reminds them with all these different pictures that he gave to John, all these different visions connected to me, you are victorious now and forever. The picture that John saw here in chapter 14 was of an angel, he said, flying in the middle of the sky, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to all the inhabitants of the earth, to every tribe, nation, people, and language. It was a reminder to those people who were being persecuted at the time of John, which was toward the end of the first century A.D., being persecuted now by the Roman government, and that would continue for the next couple hundred years. And there's very much a temptation to despair, to ask the question, is it worth it living as God's children in this world? But Jesus wanted them to know it is worth it. This message that tells you that you are victorious in Jesus, that every sin, every guilt has been taken away, every bit of punishment that a sinner deserves has been put on Jesus while on his cross, and you've been given his innocence, and that he makes that yours simply through faith, trusting what God says, that's the message. And he says, it'll never stop. People will try to bury it, and suppress it. And that's kind of the message about a, a Reformation observance. We look back to the time when that was happening in the Middle Ages, but you know, it really went on quite a bit through the history of the world. All you have to do is go back to the, the history of the people of Israel as it's recorded in the Old Testament in the books of Samuel and Kings to see that the kings of Israel who were to be spiritual leaders of God's people so many of them suppressed God's word and they loved the, led the people into the worship of, of gods, false gods from the nations that lived around them. But occasionally, God in his mercy would raise up a king in Israel, or not in Israel, in Judah, who would see what was going on, who understood what God's word says, and he said, nope, we got to go back to these scriptures, to these commands of our God. Such a king would have been Josiah. And then, in the times of the Apostle John and the Apostles, not long after Jesus had ascended into heaven, already teachings were creeping in. Paul's letter to the Galatians is an example that again took the focus off of Jesus and put the emphasis on the person. You need to make yourself right with God. You need to go back to the Old Testament rules. Yes, Jesus died for your sins, but not enough. And that was what was happening in the Middle Ages in the church in which Martin Luther grew up. That same ugly teaching that said it's not purely by God's undeserved love for you. And it's not purely by a, a trust, a faith in what God has done for you. But you need to add something to what Jesus has done. And again, the pure message, the comforting message was covered up but God, again, in his mercy and in his grace, raised up people at that time, Martin Luther, one of them, as he was forced to go back into the scriptures because he was full of despair. Listening to what he had been taught in his church caused him to think, and he was right, there is nothing I can do to please God and make myself acceptable to him so that I can live with him in heaven. And that's the entire message of every one of God's commandments as we look at them and lay them against our lives. There is nothing I can do. I have nothing good to offer God for which he should receive me into his heavenly kingdom. But when Luther was driven into the scriptures and finds a, a statement from the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Romans that says, but now a righteousness from God has been made known. God gives to people what he demands of them, a perfect life, and he gives it in the form of his son Jesus. That's 
the comforting message. That's the strengthening message. That's the message of victory. That's the gospel, the good news. And Jesus, giving John this vision of that angel flying in the middle of the sky, was his message to John and to the churches, the believers to whom John was first writing, and they were churches scattered around what would today be the western part of Turkey. But ultimately, it's a message for every believer and every Christian congregation that as much as the devil and those who work in cahoots with him would love to suppress God's word, it is the eternal gospel. Which is why our thought for tonight is that gospel angel is still flying. That gospel will never be totally suppressed. It will be around to the end of time. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And Jesus giving this picture to, to John 1,900 years ago was a prophecy that that word would continue to be proclaimed. It says the angel was proclaiming or had the eternal gospel to proclaim. So it was a prophecy about what went on at the time of Luther when that eternal gospel was brought out into the open again. It was a prophecy about what, uh, what happened back in the early to mid-1800s when German Lutherans uh, were not happy when the German governments were telling the churches, this is what you have to teach. So they left. They said, we're going to stick with the pure word of God. And they came to this country. And John, seeing that angel with the eternal gospel, was also a prophecy from Jesus of what still goes on today. Every parent who teaches Jesus to their little ones, every grandparent who assists in that is fulfillment of this prophecy, that that eternal gospel is still being proclaimed today. Our teachers in our Lutheran elementary school, our pastors, members who talk to each other in bringing comfort to one another say, you've got a Savior, Jesus, who's forgiven all your sins. He's got a life in heaven for you. It's fulfillment of this prophecy. That gospel angel is still flying. So let's fly with him. Parents, keep bringing up children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Grandparents assist. Members, as we support the mission of the church with, with our prayers to our Heavenly Father, with our offerings to our Savior, we're supporting that eternal gospel that through our synods missionaries going out to every people, tribe, nation, and language of this earth. The gospel angel is still flying. May we fly with him and continue also to proclaim that eternal gospel in our homes in our community, in our world. And may we also do what the angel was commanding to be done. John heard the angel say, Worship the Lord, for the day of his judgment is at hand. Worship the Lord. Well, the most obvious thing we think of when we hear that is what we are doing right now. We have gathered that our Savior might serve us that he might feed us with that precious, eternal gospel, that good news, as it comes in the word that we hear, as it comes in the supper of his body and blood. We are strengthened to worship him by bringing our songs of praise, our, our prayers to him, as we'll do in just a, a few minutes, our confession of faith for everybody to hear. But then when... The angel says, worship the Lord. That's not just about when we get together for about an hour in this building, but it involves what goes on in our daily lives as well. The Apostle Paul was inspired to write to the Romans, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your worship. This is how you honor your God. And we add the word to that, 
do that fearlessly. The same things that were going on in John's time were going on at Luther's time. When Luther stood up for the truth, he was declared to be a heretic and an outlaw. People were allowed, if you, if you could, you could kill him. And there is still to this day opposition to God's pure word, to his pure commands, which, which have not changed. And when you live by those commands, honoring authorities as he commands in the fourth commandment, respecting human life at every stage as he says you shall not kill, respecting marriage, God's way of marriage and family, you get blowback on that. You get opposition. But as all these others did, fearlessly you can worship the Lord in your life. You can be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whose lives were on the line. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, our God can save us from this furnace that you're going to throw us into. He might not, but he can. And just know this, that even if he doesn't, he decides this is the end of our lives, we're still not going to bow down to your false gods. Luther stood up before the powers that were in the church and in the government, and fearlessly, you and I can worship the Lord too. Because as with all those others that we just mentioned, we know the truth of the words of that psalm that we sing. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way. That eternal gospel and the gospel angel, that prophecy that it would continue to be proclaimed, he's still flying. He's flying in, in God's church as that gospel message is proclaimed. So may we fly with him, continue to proclaim that word purely in our homes, support it, and live it. Amen. The peace of God that goes beyond our understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll confess our faith with the Nicene Creed, page 6. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we pray the prayer of the church, we include special prayers. Uh, we join with David and Cheryl Benicke in celebrating and giving thanks to God on their 50th wedding anniversary, also with Norman and Audrey Gunther on their 65th wedding anniversary. We ask the Lord to provide care and healing and recovery for Carol Fabish as she undergoes surgery next week, and we pray for the Lord's comfort for the family of Howard Gibson, who was called from this life this past week, and there will be a private family service tomorrow. Let us pray. Gracious God, mighty fortress, valiant one, always present with us with your gifts and spirit, 
Let your word remain our treasure, that your kingdom may be ours forever. Lord of hosts, you are our refuge and our fortress. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Keep us watchful so that no one deceives us. Open our lips to give reason for the hope that we have. Lord of hosts, you are our refuge and our fortress. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Let your word be taught in its truth and purity, that your kingdom may come and your will be done by people near and far. Lord of hosts, you are our refuge and our fortress. With your holy word, give strength and faithfulness to the president of our synod, the presidents of its districts and all our circuit pastors. May they lead your congregations to be firm in the faith and focused on your eternal mission. Lord of hosts, you are our refuge and our fortress. Lord, let the living voice of your gospel be heard as your word is preached, taught, and sung for the joy and strengthening of your holy church. Lord of hosts, you are our refuge and our fortress. Help your people freely in every need, those who are troubled, weak, or sick. By our own powers, we can do nothing, but you are our strength and shield. Lord of hosts, you are our refuge and our fortress. Loving Father, we love because you first loved us. We praise and thank you for your love for Dave and Cheryl Benneke and Norman and Audrey Gunther through the many years of their marriages. Continue to bless them. Lift and strengthen them by the power of your word that their love for each other continues to reflect your love for them. Gracious Father, all health and healing are gifts from your hand. We pray for Carol Fabish. Give her doctors and nurses the wisdom and skill as they work for her healing. And while she waits and faces many unknowns, calm all doubts and fears with the word of your promise that nothing can separate us from your love that is ours in Christ Jesus. And Lord Jesus, your holy word promises that you will wipe away every tear from our eyes in that day when there is no more death or mourning or pain. With your promise, dry the tears of those who weep for Howard Gibson, that with faith, they and we may look forward to the blessed joy of heaven with you. And now listen, Lord, to the thoughts and cares of our hearts. Lord God, Heavenly Father, You did not spare your only Son, but gave him up for us all to be our Savior, and along with him you have graciously given us all things. We thank you for your precious, saving gospel. Give us steadfast faith in our Savior, and in him give us righteousness, wisdom, comfort, and peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll stand as we prepare for our Savior's Supper. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God, our Father, and to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. During the distribution of the supper, we join in singing hymn 390, Salvation unto us has come. With our hearts prepared in repentance, all is ready for receiving our Savior's supper. Please come at the direction of the usher.
the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Go in peace. Please stand as we give our thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Almighty, our refuge and fortress, do not let us be afraid when the world fights against your truth and against your people. Keep us steadfast in your word, that we may fear you and give you glory, even when the end is coming. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. I think pretty much everything in the way of announcements is, is in the service folder. There are still sign-up sheets for uh, Advent by Candlelight for the ladies uh, at both of the, the exits. Um, as the announcement has been, hymnals are here. If you, uh, would like, if you ordered one, you'd like to pick it up, stop in at the office during office hours, or we can help you out with that too. Other than that, Lord's blessings on the rest of the week and on your weekend, and we'll see you again soon in the Lord's house.